Welcome to this webinar from the Archiware webinar Wednesday series of webinars. Uh, this one is titled Remote Working Workflows with Archiware P5 and Luma Forge Jellyfish. I'm David Fox from Archiware UK. You can get me on that email address. Uh, with me, I've got uh, Raybar Chenna from Luma, For Luma Forge. Oops. <laughs> Hi, Raybar. Hey, everybody. How are you? I'm really good, thanks. Thanks for joining me again. We did the EU version of this uh, webinar a few hours ago, and this is for the US time zone. So we're fully polished, and I can say LumaForge without slipping up. So there's, uh, <laughs> there's Raybar's uh, email address if you want to get in touch with Raybar. So I'm going to kick off by talking a little bit here about uh, Archiware. For those of you that might not be familiar with Archiware, the product, uh, then Raybar's going to do a couple of slides on uh, the jellyfish. Then we're going to show you some really interesting live demos around using a jellyfish, using one remotely, and how P5 can get involved there to replicate between jellyfishes uh, and also to archive some data off of a jellyfish to the cloud. Uh, this webinar will be about 35 minutes of content with however long we spend answering your questions at the end, maybe another 10 minutes. So we won't be the full hour, we'll be about three quarters of an hour. We don't want to take up too much of your day. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about Archiware. Uh, it's data management. It's a data management software suite. That means we do archival backup and replication of your media data from wherever it might reside, quite likely on a jellyfish, we think. Uh, this is a cross-platform software-only product, so it's software that you install wherever you want to install it. It runs on all of the usual operating systems, runs on various other NAS devices in addition to Jellyfish. You can deploy it in AWS Cloud. You can hook it up to cloud storage. You can use it with all manner of other hardware. The whole thing is relatively easy to set up for the kind of sophistication that you're getting with this product, uh, meaning that you don't need to be an IT professional to to use P5, the web interface is pretty straightforward. You'll see how it works in a little later on. Uh, clicking for the next slide. So data management software suite, what is that? Uh, it's a, it's, well, to begin with, let's say that it's very popular in media-rich environments, meaning media, entertainment, broadcast, etc., where you guys tend to create a lot of media data, and then uh, you need to be able to handle it in a, in a kind of efficient way. So we do that across four different modules, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, as I've already said, I think we run and install almost anywhere. So that means in addition to being on maybe your Jellyfish, you can run on some other uh, operating system host NAS device and have those have the Jellyfish and the other host talking to each other, transferring data. Uh, we work with physical storage hardware like tape drives in libraries from any of the vendors that make that kind of equipment. Uh, literally any of those vendors will support their hardware. And the software is purchased outright. It's not a subscription service. There is an annual maintenance contract, which you can renew each year to get updates and support. But once you buy the product, you own it in perpetuity. So you can keep running it and you can migrate it across different platforms if you wish. So the product uh, consists of four different modules. So you can choose which of these you want to run. Um, let me just... Uh, not advance the slide, but go to a pointer. So starting with P5 Backup on the left-hand side uh, and P5 Archive, both of these products are able to write backup and archive data to disk, tape, and cloud. So that means you could be backing up to another Jellyfish or a NAS device, but you could alternatively back up to an LTO drive attached directly to your Jellyfish via a SAS interface, or you can back up or archive to a cloud vendor like Amazon AWS, Backblaze, B2, Google, uh, Azure, and many others, as I've got a list on the next slide. So the difference between backup and archive, given that they both are able to write to the same types of storage, is that a backup is a disaster recovery workflow. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows what a backup is. Uh, it's for disaster recovery to get you out of a tight spot. Uh, and it does that by copying your important data to one of these pieces of storage. And importantly, with a backup, you don't generally keep data that you've backed up forever. 
So you don't keep data that you've backed up for 10 years. Maybe after one year, you reuse the storage and recycle and allow new backups to take the place of older ones. So contrast that with P5 Archive, where we're creating a, data, a workflow to move data from your storage, let's say your storage is a, is a jellyfish. So maybe that jellyfish is filling up, but there's two products, projects that you uh, delivered two or three months ago, and you can archive those. You can take those offline, off the jellyfish, make, make space, and then use P5 Archives workflow to be able to look into those offline, um, uh, at the offline data, at see it there in the archive and then pull it back onto disk if you need to because you need to repurpose something from a from a previous project that you worked on so archiving is moving data rather than copying to create space sorry i keep clicking and moving my slide uh it's keeping it forever for the long term uh and we have something that we call a mini mam that's media asset management that helps locate archive data which we'll see in the demo in a couple of minutes so that's backup and archive. P5 Synchronize is also one of the modules that we're going to show in this uh, LumaForge Jellyfish demo. P5 Synchronize is different. It's cloning or replicating data between two disks, typically on two different hosts. So in our demo, we're going to be replicating data between one jellyfish in Burbank, California, and another jellyfish sitting next to Ray Bar in Washington, DC. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with P5 Synchronize. You can do that on an ad hoc basis. You can do it on a scheduled basis. You can do it over a LAN between two devices on the same building, or you can do it across a wide area network, or indeed a VPN, which is what we'll be doing. Uh, the beauty of having a replica of data is that it's like an immediate backup. You can immediately access and fail over to that second copy if you want to. Uh, it allows you to transmit data to a different location. Maybe you've got somebody remotely working on an edit in a different uh, city or country, uh, and you need to transfer a whole project's worth of assets to another chunk of storage so somebody can sit against that storage and work on it. Uh, snapshots and versioning are an additional feature. This basically means that when some uh, a, another version of an asset arrives uh, that might normally overwrite the previous version of that file, we can keep the previous version of that file. So you've got a, a, a copy of all the previous versions as a file is changing. Finally, backup to go. Uh, just very briefly, it's a workstation backup product. Product It can back up a bunch of workstations, Mac OS or Windows, back to a central host with some storage attached, like a jellyfish. So you could use your jellyfish to back up 30, 60, 100 workstations, maybe in an educational environment, something like that. So if you've got that need, then check out uh, P5 Backup to Go. Uh, just really quickly, uh, the archive and backup modules support disk, tape, and cloud. So disk support means any kind of disk, however it's attached. Tape means any vendor. We don't lock you or tie you in to any particular turnkey uh, vendor-specific solution. So you can hook up uh, a single standalone drive from any vendor or a library. We support all generations of LTO, and you can use multiple drives in parallel in various interesting ways to get redundancy or additional throughput. And then our cloud support covers uh, Amazon's S3 and Glacier and Snowball, uh, Microsoft Azure, Backblaze B2, which we really uh, is really popular in media environments, Google Cloud more recently, Wasabi Hot Cloud, which is an American storage vendor, has European uh, data center as well, as does Backblaze B2. So all of the main vendors that are into support, uh, storing your data on a kind of gigabyte per month cost structure. Um, we don't support the more consumery cloud storage uh, products like Dropbox or Google Drive. That's not really uh, enterprise type cloud storage. It's going to be too expensive for this kind of use. So uh, that's a lot of words from me. So now lots of words from Raybar, please, <laughs> uh, about <laughs> LumaForge while I have a breather. Thanks, Dave. That was a really good overview of uh, Oracle Ray P5. Um, yes. Thanks, everybody. For those who have not heard of LumaForge or the Jellyfish, this will be like a little overview of that. Uh, so uh, who is LumaForge? What do we do? Uh, we are a um, video workflow server company that is built by video editors, filmmakers, creatives, and all of us really just believe in making great video. 
So, and that's how we think we will change the world. So what we've done is, you know, we all have lived our own lives outside of Luma Forge as editors in different agencies, mark, you know, different verticals. And we brought all of that knowledge back to the space. And we've taken that and used our collective problems that we ran into and we specifically designed the jellyfish, which is shared storage for video teams of all sizes. And what makes us really unique is that we work with thousands of, you know, companies and clients that are, you know, thousands of, you know, jellyfish users on uh, developing the best practices for their unique team, which means, you know, what workflow they will go through when they purchase a jellyfish, uh, being, you know, what NLE they're using, uh, what are they using for their backup and archive. Uh, and we try to make that as easy as possible for our end user so they don't have to suffer uh, in the technicalities of things and focus more on the creative and getting things done while being smart and backing up and archiving. Um, so what we've done is we really provide a, a solution to video editors that focuses on the creative, uh, it's scalable, it's plug and play, as easy as one can make it. And the world's biggest brands are actually enjoying their workflow and going into the office daily to edit and do create magic. Um, and you know, as all technology companies go, ours included, uh, we are one of those who would like to forecast for the future. And you know, as you all know, we're going through a pandemic. So you know, during you know, right before NAB, we were gonna we we're gonna we're preparing to release the Jellyfish Remote Access, which is a, a tool that we're gonna be talking about in the next couple of slides. Um, and we decided to release that prior to NAB because NAB was not gonna happen. Uh, and that has been a way for us to make sure that, you know, people who have jobs who had to go into an office and directly connect to a jellyfish uh, can now, which is their active prime on, on prem storage, can now access that storage from home or from anywhere where they have access to the internet. So um, if Dave, if you wanna to go to the next slide, I can go over uh, what we offer uh, on the LumaForge side. Uh, again, we are shared storage, so we are, you know, on-prem, you know, this is gonna live with you. So we have uh, the Jellyfish family starts with the Jellyfish Mobile, uh, which is our smallest unit that you can get. It's anywhere between 32 terabytes to 96, depending on your team's need. Uh, this does not require a server room. It can live in the room with you. It's whisper quiet and you can connect up to 14 direct attached users to it, which means that, you know, you could take a uh, CAT 6A or 7, you know, Ethernet port uh, cable and plug that into the back of the Jellyfish and into your, uh, jelly, you know, iMac Pro, PC, or Linux box or machine. Yeah. Um, and this, again, this just sits on the table with you. So it's like, you know, right next to you. A lot of people use it on, you know, remote locations where they go out on site. Uh, DITs love this box. It's it's a beast for what it does. You know, you can I love, the fact, it, I love the fact it has a handle on the top as well. It's it really does. Neat. Yeah. And, and and honestly, before a pandemic happened, I was traveling with my jellyfish, which is the one we're going to be looking at today. Uh, and I had it in a Pelican case, and I would fly with it all over the world. Right. So it's it's definitely something that um, is is built. You know, it's like a racehorse. Uh, so um, the jellyfish tower is the next up in, in the lineup, uh, and this one is going to be for you know in-house medium-sized teams. Uh, again, it can live in the room with you. Uh, it's a lot beefier with dual processors, a lot more RAM. Uh, it's a ZFS-based platform. Uh, you know, up to 22 direct connections, and then you have more parity in the drives. So uh, if you're if you, you have a bigger team like an in-house agency, you might want to use that. Uh, if you don't have a server room, if you do have a server room, you can switch over to the rack and uh, you can build on that. Again, it's practically identical to the uh, tower, but it has a little bit more um, capabilities on expansion and it can live inside of a uh, server room. Uh, again, a lot of this stuff is, you know, no switch required. Um, it's compact for you enclosure, so it's small, you know, footprint in the server room, uh, but you can add more expansions as well as if you wanted to, you really could hook this into a switch environment and make it shine. Um, and then for the thirsty ones out there who are like, you know, enterprise level, 100, 150 editors within their organization, you know, we can go with the BFJ, which is our bigger, faster jellyfish. Yeah. So uh, we're looking at multi, multi petabyte solution with an integrated flash pool. So we're talking, you know, what do you want to throw at it? It has a hundred gig backbone. It actually goes into a, you know, cascading switch environment. So you can have, you know, a lot of our companies, we have a company in Norway um, that 
that is a broadcast uh, company there that you know deploys one of these. Uh, so that's kind of like where we see a lot more of these kind of get integrated or, or higher, you know, higher end, you know, technology companies. So cool. uh, that's that guy. So you know, any company, you know, hardware is great, but uh, you kind of need something to talk to that hardware. So we've come up with two softwares that comes with every Jellyfish, uh, and that is the Jellyfish Connect which is going to be the uh, Mac OS software that we uh, deploy with every Jellyfish, which means that you can order a Jellyfish, uh, download the Jellyfish Connect software, and um, when you connect that Jellyfish to your computer, you can launch the software and automatically detect the Jellyfish, connect it to your computer, set up everything from you know uh, the speed that the Jellyfish is connected to your computer, which you know in most cases for editing these days is 10 gig, um, it will do all the settings for you in your network settings. Uh, as an editor, you do not have to do anything but just follow the directions on screen, and you'll be ready to go editing in 4K, making sure that your pipe, you're getting the most bandwidth out of that connection. Um, and in the Connect app, you can also access our Jellyfish support, as well as you know other tutorials and so on and so forth. Um, and on the management side, uh, we're talking about you know, again, a lot of our clients are editors and we do have IT teams who who purchase Jellyfish, but we are really advocating for the end user, which is the editor. Uh, and the Jellyfish manager is actually gonna be something where it's, we've taken something that's really complex where mostly some somebody had to sit at a terminal and type stuff in, like code in to get these things to work. We've actually gone in and made it really, really simple and graphical for the editor to understand. So what used to take, you know, a few emails in a couple hours to do, which is, hey, I want to build a new share or a partition for a comp for a client that I'm working with. And now yeah. you can do it in two clicks. Yeah. Um, so same thing with users and giving permissions and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, I love the fact then, that you can have a, just interrupting, that you can just take a jellyfish that has the uh, four or eight 10 gig Ethernet ports directly in the back. You just need 10 cables. And if you're using recent Mac hardware, you've got uh, the ability to have 10 gig uh, Ethernet ports directly on your Mac minis and Mac, iMac Pros and so on. Uh, so no additional hardware needed in most cases, just a cable into the back of the Jellyfish and you've got a work group editing on the same uh, storage. Exactly. And and, that, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, honestly, as, as long as I know, like, you know, technology is just going towards, you know, Ethernet's cool, Thunderbolt's cool, but, um, you know, like this, everything comes in, in house. Like now it's like my, you know, iMac Pro has that, my Mac Pro has it, my Mac Mini has the 10 gig connection. So yeah. I think we're yeah. kind of going that route. So it's it's just as easy as making sure you have the right cable. And it's um, what would have been fiber channel and all of the additional hardware to it to to get file access on a SAN via fiber channel is now kind of moving towards 10 gig Ethernet is kind of being democratized. It's kind of everywhere now and it's cheap. So you don't really need to use fiber channel at this level to get 4K, yeah. 6K editing speeds. Absolutely. I mean, and even if you go fiber optics, I mean, glass is kind of expensive. So, and it's yeah. really fragile. So mm -hmm. if you, I mean, I think for editors, for the sake of, you know, small teams, large teams, uh, the, you know, the run length on these things, um, you know, a lot of times people, the editors are either in their office. So, you know, within 300 feet with a Cat6A mm -hmm. or 7, you're good. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. no latency versus, you know, uh, if you get off, you know, you know, Fiber optics, yeah, you can run that thing forever, but uh, you might actually, you know, have somebody step on it. It might break. And it's then fragile. Yeah, it. by comparison. Yeah. 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 And um, so if you want to go to the next slide, I yep. could uh, talk about our the thing that we're going to use today to actually do a lot of the demo, which is our Jellyfish Remote Access. Again, this is a uh, something that LumaForge did to help, you know, prior, we were going to release this to NAB, but we, we got ahead of ourselves because of COVID. Um, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer VPN, um, which means that, you know, you're able to access, you know, pretty much the work group that used to connect to the Jellyfish directly via Tenge can now go home and access their Jellyfish from their house uh, over the internet. Uh, and it's a encrypted, end-to-end, -end, you know, encryption managed by our support team at LumaForge, um, where you would go in and, you know, you give our team the host ID of your computer and they'll add you to that uh, network 
Uh, and what we've done, you know, for this, it's pretty much, you know, we work off of the jellyfish from our houses nowadays because I can't go into the office. And in my case, I'm across the country. So what I do is I usually have my team in, in Burbank create proxies for a active project and I edit off of those app proxies. And we will show that in this demo. Uh, and then you can, you know, let's say if it's something that, hey, look, uh, we have a bunch of files in Burbank, I need to access that really quick. Uh, I can copy those off to my regular desktop or I can use P5 sync to co get that stuff over from one jellyfish to another. Um, and, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, what can I expect from editing remotely like this? Uh, again, it really just depends on your internet speed. Um, again, I'm at home right now. I'm about, I'm, I get about 200 megabytes download speed and then, you know, about 20 upload. Uh, so my speeds aren't that great, but in Burbank, we've got fiber. So uh, the upload speeds are going to be a lot faster and so are the download speeds. So it really depends on the experience that you're looking for. And uh, as, as, as a tip to everybody, if you're gonna do this remote type of work, I highly recommend that you connect to the uh, to your router via wired cable, like a Cat5e or something, instead of going over Wi-Fi, because that's just gonna cause more interruptions in your edit. Um, yeah. So yeah, Dave. Let's click on, okay. Right. Um, before we switch ends and we start looking at uh, Raybar's screens, this slide is just telling, letting us know that we're going to be looking at uh, Raybar's jellyfish with his connected clients in DC uh, using jellyfish as local shared storage. So there's no VPNing or anything clever going on here. This is just SMB mounts from the jellyfish to the Mac using the Connect tool. So let me just switch over and change the presenter to Raybar, like so. So we All jump right. now from London to Washington. I like saying that. And we uh, over, off we go. So we are now in Washington, D.C., or the local time is 1.22. Yeah. Yeah. The clock um, there you go. <laughs> uh, so we are here. Uh, pretty much I have my jellyfish connected to this computer, which is a MacBook Pro of 2016. Um, or 20, you know, it's a, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a 16 inch, the new MacBook Pro. Uh, I'm connected via a uh, OWC Thunder Dock, uh, you know, uh, adapter because I don't have, yeah, because I don't have a uh, iMac Pro here on, on site, so I can't directly yep. connect it. And you can't even get one gig uh, Ethernet interfaces on MacBook Pros. So whatever you do, you're going to have to have a dongle. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, I'm going to launch our Jellyfish Connect app, which is uh, up here in my dock. And it will tell me that there is a – this is configured for you guys because we want to make sure this, this was a speedy demo. Uh, this is the Jellyfish. It's configured. It's a 48 terabyte mobile. It tells you exactly where uh, the port is that it, I'm connected to on the back of the server. And if I go into my network preferences, I will show you exactly where that is. So under Jellyfish, uh, I've got that port number that matches our Connect app. Uh, and then in the advanced settings in the hardware tool, this has all been configured for me. So again, jumbo frames, 9,000 for 10 gig you know, editing. Um, again, because I don't want to be doing 4K stuff or 6K stuff over uh, 1 gig. So uh, the Jellyfish once I have Connect app uh, adds that Jellyfish named interface onto your uh, your Mac and um, uh, and sets it up with the right IP address and jumbo frames, etc. It does that for you. Absolutely. That way, as an editor, you don't have to worry about doing all that on your own. Sure. Um, and this is done for you, so it just kind of foolproofs the uh, the editing experience. Yeah. So under uh, shares, uh, this is where you would go to pretty much just to explain to some people out there who don't know what we're talking about here. But uh, the jellyfish is a one is one giant pool, and then within that pool, you can have different data sets. So this is like a, it's almost like a partition. So I have a bunch of these partitions here. So if I wanted to mount one, which is this DC jellyfish, which is part of my the overall pool. I can uh, hit this button right here, and it will ask me for an SMB uh, username and password, uh, so I can log into that. Uh, and once I do that, uh, it will give me a jellyfish uh, mount on my desktop. Now, if I want this thing to be there forever, I can hit auto mount, which means that uh, the next time I turn off my computer and turn it back on, and if all the wires are connected, I, this will automatically mount to my desktop. Uh, and to access this file or this share, I double click the SMB logo there or actually just the, you know, 
the DC jellyfish. And it will see that there's some data in here that we can look into. So if I pull this file, I can press spacebar to play it. Uh, and here's a video file playing back uh, real time. So that's how I'm actually able to do um, just directly connect to the jellyfish, super simple. Uh, and also here we can just take, uh, you know, if I'm working off of a, a project using any NLE, all my media would live on the jellyfish. Uh, you don't need to put, you know, you don't need to pull, you know, push and pull from the server to your desktop. Uh, you're going to have the speeds to actually do everything on the jellyfish. Cool. So um, let me go into this. Uh, if I can pull up the presentation here. Yep. Uh, Yep, there we go. So that was number one. Number two, so number one. jellyfish remote access. So the diagram gets slightly more complicated now. So we've got two premises. We've got the office, which is Burbank on the left-hand side of the screen, where we have a jellyfish mobile uh, with but no doubt on a LAN with some other machines on the LAN with it. Uh, on the right-hand side, we've got uh, Raybar's place in DC, where he's got his client machine. And you can see at the top, we've got Jellyfish Remote Access. So this is kind of the VPN point-to-point -point service that uh, Jellyfish, uh, that uh, LumaForge rather set up for you, where the two machines effectively get um, connected to something that you can think of like a switch. Uh, so the, the two machines are connected to the switch, which means they're effectively on the same network and they can talk to each other. So that means that uh, Raybar is going to be able to mount the storage from the Jellyfish in jellyfish in Burbank and work with it just like he did with the local one a moment ago with the only difference being that it's going to be as quick as his internet connection rather than being as quick as a 10 gig uh, ethernet cable so quite a difference there but apart from that you can do everything that you can do uh, just slower so uh, I think now what we need to do is just switch max at your end Raybar right so yeah, so I have so I have two Macs connected to to my internet here uh, one of them the one that we're about to go into is going to be the one that has allowed um, the Jellyfish remote access to that Mac or to the Jellyfish in Burbank. So um, as you can see, uh, this is a different desktop than the other one was. Uh, and now I can go into my Jellyfish Connect app uh, under setup. It's discovered a 40 ter 48 terabyte mobile, which is on my network and at home, uh, but it's also configured the 32 terabyte remote jellyfish, which is the one in Burbank. So what I'm going to do is show you where this the remote settings are for the jellyfish and how for remote access. So uh, once you download the Jellyfish Connect app under settings, uh, there's a remote access uh, tool down here. Uh, and right now we have a blue light, which means it's active. So if I hit the setup, it'll tell me exactly what my ID is and then my network ID. Uh, and I can disconnect from it anytime I want. But for the sake of this demo, we cannot disconnect because we need it. Uh, and we're going to go to the shares tab and I'm going to type in, um, gel, you know, just jellyfish and it'll, you can type, you, know, you can, if you have like a long list of shares, you can actually just mount the one that you're looking for. So I'm going to type, I'm going to mount this guy in jellyfish SMB. Uh, and again, because this is an SMB share, uh, I'm going to need my credentials to get into it. So I'm going to type in my name because in Burbank, they have me set up with my name. And I'm going to include the password. And I will connect that. So now that I'm connected, uh, I can, again, auto mount that as well. And every time I turn on my computer, my second computer, it will automatically mount to the jellyfish in Burbank. Uh, for the sake of Testing right now, we're not going to do that. Um, I'm going to open up the Jellyfish SMB by double clicking it, and you'll start to see that it's populating based on my internet speed. So, uh, for the sake of uh, demoing today, I'm going to be using this uh, 2019 Kurdistan documentary, which is a documentary about my father, who's an artist in Kurdistan. Uh, and if I open up the project, I have a uh, back in Kurdistan. Um, project here, it's a Premiere Pro project. You can have any type of project, you know, Final Cut, uh, DaVinci, Avid, uh, Premiere, and it'll do just fine. But just so people know, we are working from the Burbank Jellyfish. This is like directly from it. So I'm gonna right click it and I'm gonna say open in Premiere Pro 2020. Yep. So while that's opening, um, I'm gonna show you guys the layout of the land. Uh, the way I work is I have a projects folder. I have a footage folder where all my original footage goes, uh, audio, where audio is, and then my proxies, which is 
Uh, again, when I'm working with 4K footage, I want to make proxies. Uh, so that way I can actually edit, uh, you know, to the best of my ability with the internet connection that was given. So as you guys can see, this is loading uh, right now. Uh, everything is being, uh, the scratch, you know, tracks are being built out uh, on the jelly, you know, on my pretty much from the jellyfish and Burbank onto my displayed on my computer here using Premiere Pro. Yeah. So all of these are going to start populating. Uh, you'll see that it's pending media because it's going over the wire. But as you can see that, you know, this is my file is, is, is prepped now that I have, there's nothing down here that tells me it's not. Uh, so if I go back to the beginning of this file, I can actually just hit um, space to start yeah. playing. Yeah. And this is, again, real time from Burbank. So we're going to see some jitters. I'm not sure how the playback is on your end. On my end, I'm, I'm doing fine. There's no drop frames yet. That looks but, fine here as well, to be honest. Yeah, yeah and you might, you might run into drop frames and stuff. But again, this is going to depend on your internet speed. Mm. Um, and so I can just press pause. If I'm like, oh, this clip, uh, I don't want to use it, I can hit delete. Uh, I can then, you know, zoom in to the track. Do all the things like, that you might normally do. do. All, yeah. yeah, do all the things yeah. that an editor would do, and just it, you know, just you got to make sure that you know it takes takes a little bit because again, we're you know we're going over the wire. So yeah. Um, yeah. But here I am. I'm about to go through here and do some work. I mean, it's 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 great. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, it's this is something that I would do because this is something that I need to get done. So yeah, <laughs> um, and also I'm thinking that if somebody is familiar with working at you know, in the same building as the storage, uh, if they've got this set up, they literally have to do nothing differently. They'll just find things a bit slower and they might need to just go in the direction of uh, editing with proxies rather than the original media. But apart from that, they don't need to get involved in like the complexities of copying a project off the off the server to local storage and then remembering which one they're using and so on. So if your internet speed will support it, the simplicity of just working off the storage back in the office is hard to beat. Absolutely. And honestly, here's here's the thing. Like if I'm I'm in here and I'm gonna go and I'll say uh, I'm gonna save it, so I'll hit Command S. So mm -hmm. it's gonna save. And here's our back in Kurdistan project file. Last time it was saved as 11:58 a.m. and now it's 1:31 p.m. So it's saving yeah. it to the Jellyfish in Burbank. Uh, and now that if I'm if I'm finished with it and if I have another editor who wants to pick it up, they can get in there and, and work with that. Uh, yeah. But again, if you let's say if you're like, hey, you know what? My Internet speed is really not it's garbage and I can't really work with this. Uh, you can just pretty much take uh, the file, the project file, copy this, you know, to your desktop. Um, sorry, hold up two different things. Mm. Uh, just take this guy, um, which is actually a tiny file. Yeah, it's really tiny. So I'm trying yeah. to I pretty much just want to get my grip here. Uh, there it is. So I'm copying that to the desktop as well as I can take my proxy folders and copy that to the desktop as well and do my edit. When I'm done, I'll just re, you know, save it as a new version uh, because I did some editing and I can put that all back into the project folder for mm -hmm. the next time I go in there. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a matter of, you know, just finding your way to work. Uh, again, you know, proxy, when it comes to proxy creation, you know, you could use different tools, Adobe projects, when you set them up, you can have, you have the opportunity to set the proxy then and there. Um, I usually do 480p uh, just to get my file sizes down. Um, I personally use Kino to do the proxy creation because it's so, so much more simpler. Um, and it, it goes on from there. So uh, like, while we're here, yeah, sorry, go for it, Dave. I was going to say, it's just like editing 12 years ago, 480p. Yeah, there you yeah. go. So uh, just while we're here, I want to show you guys that there is a uh, Burbank, you know, we, in Burbank, we have a share called P5Sync. Mm -hmm. So this is the share that we will, we've created so we could use, so we can use this share to actually do the, the next two uh, ex exercises in this demo, which is uh, syncing from one jellyfish to another, as well as archiving. So uh, I'm going to mount this jellyfish share, which is called the P5Sync, uh, on my desktop just so you guys can see what's inside of it. Uh, and once it's mounted, I will open it up. And so now here is our P5 sync. So I've got a couple of folders here. Uh, we've got this folder called for DC jellyfish. And as you can see, there's four files. Uh, they're not that big of files, but uh, for the sake of demo purposes, this is what we have. So I'm gonna press play on this. This is gonna be going to Burbank to grab the file and it's gonna play back over encrypted network 
So uh, this again could be pretty much this is what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, and what we're going to do is, which is the next slide, which I will show everybody. If I can find the link, there it is. So, boom, here we are. So for this, we just went over this guy, uh, which was the. Uh, Actually, that's the, one, that's the one that we're going to do now. The replicating. That is the one we're yeah. going to do now. Yeah, yes. that's the one we're going to do now. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, Dave, if you want to go over that. Yep. So what we've got now is the same uh, network with Burbank on the left and DC on the right. Now, these this time we've got uh, the Jellyfish in Burbank is on the VPN, as is uh, Raybar's Jellyfish Mobile in DC. So they're both connected to the same VPN network via the unique network ID that... Uh, that uh, LumaForge will give you. So you join them both to that network and then they can talk to each other via that VPN connection. They're effectively on the same switch, on the same network. Uh, so we then use P5 Synchronize. So what we do is we install P5 on both of those jellyfishes and then we use the DC jellyfish as our kind of P5 server and the Burbank jellyfish is our P5 client. So there's kind of a, a slave machine and an in-control machine in DC. And then we can use P5 Synchronize to replicate in either direction. Uh, we could, you could have more than two jellyfishes in this uh, scenario if you wanted to make it more complicated. But for the purposes of this demo, we've got two. So um, let's show you how that looks in, uh, in the P5 web interface. So um, can you hit escape for me, Raybar, to get back out of sure. the slide? And we need to switch back to the other uh, yep, Mac. Let's yep. switch back to the local Mac. That way I can show you the direct connected version. Yeah, so I'm just going to change the presenter back to the correct Mac of the two Macs that Raybar has in front of him. So we get the one with the pale desktop. Okay, so... Um, if in the browser, uh, all we've done here is we've gone to Jellyfish, which uh, the Jellyfish software makes Jellyfish the IP of the Jellyfish, if that's enough, <laughs> the words of enough times to say Jellyfish in the same sentence. So Jellyfish colon 8000 basically takes you to the P5 web admin interface as opposed to the Jellyfish uh, setup interface. Uh, which is not on port 8000. So basically, you just bookmark this URL and then you can log in. So there is a default unchanged pair of username and password, which should be changed for security reasons, of course, but uh, we don't need security for a demo. And then you get into P5's web administration interface where you do all the setup and use of P5 from doing backups over here through archiving and replication, which is what we're going to start with. Uh, plus, you get the ability over here to look at jobs that are running uh, in the future or jobs which have run recently. So you can see some jobs which we ran this morning. So I'm going to show you synchronize. And first of all, I mentioned earlier that we have to have the Burbank uh, jellyfish set up within our P5 infrastructure, which it is. So there's the Burbank jellyfish, which we identify via its IP address. Uh, and a login on there, which is pretty straightforward. The IP address is the VPN uh, IP address for it, which gets provided to you from the Jellyfish uh, software. And localhost represents the Jellyfish mobile in DC that Raybar has next to him. So first of all, I'm going to show you a manual sync. So a manual sync will allow us just to browse storage in Burbank and choose to replicate it back to DC. So here's our Burbank Jellyfish. Uh, uh, share visible within P5. So we just give that a second to uh, to load up. And then inside of that, we'll be able to see some of the folders that we saw earlier in the finder. So we've got this four DC jellyfish folder, which is the one with the four video files in it. So I want to bring that over to the DC jellyfish. So I'm going to click the sync to button down here. And then we're getting the the, uh, the shares via their full paths on the jellyfish in DC. So it's the G DC jellyfish folder that we want to copy this data to. And you see we've done this before. So I'm going to create a new folder in here. And I'll pick the next number, incoming five. 
OK, so that creates a folder on the jellyfish. And then I'll select that folder as where I want the stuff to get copied to. And I'll start the sync. And then it says the job is scheduled. Use the job monitor window. And this will now give us a running feedback of what's actually happening. So if this was a big job, you'd just leave this running. And uh, you can set up email reporting. So P5 will notify you when it's finished. Uh, there aren't many files in this folder to copy, so this will happen fairly quickly. You can also, uh, after a while, get an idea of the speed that it's going at. So whilst that's copying across, if we now browse in the finder that DC Jellyfish share, we can see our incoming five folder, the folder that we're syncing inside, and it's copied three of those four files so far, and we'll see the fourth one pop up in a sec. There it is. So yeah, I mean, if I just do a quick look on one of these, you'll see that playing back. I uh, don't know how well go to webinar coach with live video, but looked OK to me. Uh, so, yeah, those four files have been replicated across as a one off manual sync. Alternatively, you might want to make more of a workflow so we can do that via our synchronized plan section. And I'm just editing a sync plan here to give you a quick overview. So the sync plan has a name Burbank to Burbank to DC sync. The source of the data is the Burbank uh, machine. Burbank Jellyfish. This is uh, a, the directory. You can have a several that you want to copy from the Burbank. And then down here, the destination is going to be localhost. That's the DC uh, Jellyfish mobile. And then the path that you want to copy to. And then importantly, down at the bottom here, we have our synchronized schedules where we can set up the events of when we want this to run and how frequently. So I might say, OK, update the copy. Uh, every day, either at a specific time on a one-off basis, or I could say uh, between 0900 hours in the morning when people are working, I want to do an every hour update up th right through till 8 o'clock in the evening. So that will repeatedly run. And then I could say on these days of the week, I want that to run and, uh, yeah, and apply. And you can also set up filters to exclude certain files so that we don't copy files that we don't need to copy. So the effect of that would be that during the week, every hour during working hours, a folder in DC would get an updated copy of a folder in Burbank. And that might be useful because Raybar might be working on a project where there's incoming new rushes on a daily basis and he can have those coming in automatically, maybe overnight, because there's a lot of data to copy. And then in the morning, he can start work on his edit with everything from the previous day uh, visible to him, available to him to edit on locally. Absolutely. So, yeah, which could be, a really, could be a really useful thing. And another thing to, to, to look at here, I know, Dave, you might, have, you might go to this next, but in the synchronized mode, there's the update, and under it, there's a key previous file versions. Yes. Uh, I think that is a really important one to check, in my opinion, uh, just because sometimes uh, people update you know, their project files, and they, you know, they might not upload that, so it's, it's a good idea to keep those files. Yeah, so just to illustrate what that would mean, over in DC, if this file here was modified, edited, uh, added to or whatever, or changed somehow, and we run that sync again, then ordinarily the file that we currently have in DC is just going to get overwritten with the new version. So if we have that keep previous file versions box ticked, then we will get an additional folder created here called versions, and, and we will move the previous version into that folder and give it a version number at the end, and then we will retain, let's say, five or however you want to configure it, previous versions of each file. So that means that if a file comes across, but actually the previous version of that file is the one that you want, you've still got that previous version available to you. So you're not just getting stuff overwritten because people are making changes at another location. So that can be really useful uh, for, um, yeah, just general workflow stuff. Okay, so uh, that's just a quick overview of the kind of thing that you can do with P5 synchronize, which is what we have illustrated in our third replicate data between two jellyfishes uh, slide here. And the final thing that we're going to show you in our live demo is this archiving. So here we have uh, the Washington DC. We have Raybar's uh, jellyfish uh, mobile sitting here. And then what we're going to do is use the archive module to, so this isn't actually using the VPN at this point. We're just going to upload and archive completed work from the Jellyfish to, in the case of this demo, uh, some cloud storage. But this could equally be an LTO drive connected directly to this Jellyfish via a SAS connector. 
So uh, LTO8 tapes are 12 terabytes per cartridge, and they've got a write speed of over 300 megasecond. So that's quite a powerful archive format. Plus, you might want to output to LTFS and put a tape in the post and send a whole project to some other location. So a tape is quite a useful archive device, or you could be archiving off to disk. So it could be another jellyfish or some uh, you know low-end storage that you want to use for archive purposes so as I said earlier the cloud support includes backblaze b2 among others so if I flick back to my uh, p5 interface and this time go into archive so what I'll show you in here is that we have uh, under cloud service I've got a backblaze b2 uh, account configured uh, in 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 cloud language parlance, uh, a piece of storage in the cloud is called a bucket across all these different vendors. So I've created a bucket called Jellyfish P5 Storage. This is an account I've set up within B2, which has some credits on it, which allows me to store some data uh, in there. Uh, they have both e, uh, US and European um, presence. So depending on where you are in the world, you can have relatively local uh, storage. So that's set up there. Then I've got a storage pool where we've made 100 terabytes available, and we've just got a few gigabytes that we've archived to it so far. So this is all easily set up, and we've done this ahead of time in this uh, P5 interface. And then because we already have uh, both the Burbank and the local Jellyfish set up, if I go to manual archiving, I can go to the DC Jellyfish share right here and look at that incoming five folder, the one that we just copied across from uh, Burbank, and I could highlight those four movie files and add them to what we call the archive selection, which is just like a basket allowing you to add uh, files from various different folders across your storage in one go. And then I hit the archive button, and with my B2 archive workflow that I've already set up highlighted, I will hit the start button. And this will create another job, which will run in the job monitor. Uh, there you see it spinning. And what this job will be doing is picking up those movies and writing them to the B2 bucket. So in a moment, you'll see some information in that window indicating that we are copying uh, a couple of chunks of data up to the, the B2 bucket. Uh, and you'll see also a percentage of completion and a speed indicating how fast Raybar's domestic internet connection is allowing that to happen. Obviously, that speed will, will vary quite wildly depending on how fast your internet connection is. So while that's running, um, later on, let's say months ahead of time, we need to get some of these movies back because after archiving them to the cloud, we remove them from the jellyfish. We would come back into the restore part of P5 here and we would browse this index where we are currently archiving to, and then we get basically something that looks like a file system. So I can browse down DC Jellyfish, that incoming five folder, and inside of there I can see the movie files that we archived. Now that one's not finished, so let's go to the one that we archived earlier. And you see here that uh, we get a little visual icons against these, meaning that these have had previews generated for them. So after we archive to the B2 storage, but before the files were deleted from the jellyfish, we have rendered a short uh, clip of the file to allow us to see what each of these movies has within it. So as I click on these ones, you'll see that there's different content in each of these. Now you'll see these are just 10 second clips that we're creating. This is all configurable, and we just chose a relatively short time so that we didn't tie the jellyfish up, creating longer uh, transcoded low-res videos. But yeah, you can view the assets that you have archived, including st uh, still images. Uh, you can ingest metadata that might be embedded within the files themselves to search on later, or you can have editable meta metadata within this interface. So for example, I could, I could enter Burbank against this particular asset, and then our search interface within the index allows us to search for that description field. So if I come in here and search for uh, description contains the string, even just BUR, it will find any assets that have got that set against them, including one that we archived this morning. So yeah, you've got a, a search interface here. 
a hierarchical browsing of what looks like a file system and the ability to view metadata and previews and thumbnails of the assets that you archived in the past so you can easily identify what it is that you archive when you're looking to recover something back to the jellyfish from your archive and remember this archive data can be on LTO tape or it can be on cloud or it can be on any kind of disk storage that you want to make available so uh, how are we doing for time well we we're, we're, we're almost up to the hour so we better get through to our questions section haven't we Q&A uh, Q and A. so just wrapping up with a couple of slides uh, Ah, this is the Arcuware P5 uh, link to download the product. So you can go grab P5, get yourself a 30-day trial. Uh, you'll get some an email with access to some training uh, materials so you can see how to start to set it up. And then on the LumaForge side, uh, this is a page specifically about the remote access, right, Raybar? Correct. So this will be like, you know, everything you need to know about remote access and then who to reach out to to uh, get that configured on your jellyfish. Excellent. So um, I'd like to thank you, Raybar, for uh, joining me. I've enjoyed presenting Absolutely. this with you. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you learned something. I hope you can see stuff here that will be useful for you. And uh, give us a shout if you've got any questions. You've got our email addresses. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Cheers, everybody. Bye.